presentation of the day, last but not least. We're good? All right. Thank you very much. Um, in the, in the spirit of our 20th anniversary, um, every speaker today has uh, some connection uh, with online learning at SUNY, and I'm sure many of you in the room will remember our friend Michael Felstein, who spent, um, I'm not sure how many years with us, uh, a couple, a few, uh, at, um, in the SUNY Learning Network, um, I think in the early, mid-2000s. Um, and so without any further ado, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you and thank you very much for being here. Uh, it really is a pleasure to see you and to have you here with us today. Well, thank you so much for asking me. It really is an honor to be here on the 20th anniversary, your 20th birthday. Um, I, I, my parents really drilled into me as a kid not to take myself too seriously. And so I'm always a little surprised uh, when people want to hear what I have to say. And, and I, I try to cultivate that because I think of it as, as, as a teaching instinct. If I'm surprised that people think I have something to teach them, then it, 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 it's a motivation for me to attend to what they want, need to learn. Um, uh, but I, I also was really uh, surprised um, in, a, in a wonderful way uh, by how moved I was by the invitation. Um, uh, I was here in 2005, 2006, around that time. It's been a long time. Um, it's been a long journey for me. Um, and uh, I was new to higher ed at the time, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, and uh, I did not realize at the time what an important formative experience this was and how much I learned from you all. And so I am here today to repay a debt of gratitude. Um, so I'm a teacher from a family of teachers. Um, I, my, the, our family is rooted in K-12. I taught middle school and high school and then wandered in the wilderness for a while in the uh, uh, corporate e-learning uh, and knowledge management world before um, deciding I needed to get back to sanity and then decided that was coming here. Um, so this was my first higher education job. Um, and I'll be honest, um, some of it was pretty painful. Um, uh, Education, you know, you all know, it's a difficult job. Um, there are traps and tar pits. Um, and um, if you step in one, the harder you thrash to get out of it, the more stuck you get. Um, and I knew this, right? This family business, I knew all about this. Uh, uh, but I knew where the tar pits were in K-12. When I got here to SUNY, I didn't know where the higher education tar pits were. And I didn't know that I didn't know where the higher education tar pits were. I didn't know where the hard parts really were. Um, so, um, when I left here, I was, I was pretty frustrated. And I, I went on walkabout, basically. Uh, I went on a journey. Uh, it was weird. Uh, it was wonderful. I saw a lot. I learned a lot. I was very lucky. Um, and in that moment, um, when Alex asked me um, if I would come and speak, it was incredibly gracious. All, it all came, all these experiences being here came flashing back to me um, through the lens of all of that experience. And, and suddenly, it all began to make sense to me in a new way. Um, and so, 
I've been doing a lot of introspection. I hope to bring some of that. Birthdays are a good time to reflect. They're also a good time to drink. I hope to give you good reason to do at least one of those things. <laughs> um, now you all know there's a lot swirling around the future of SUNY and um, um, you know the past is a good time to think about when uh, thinking about the past is a, is a good opportunity to, to think about the future. Uh, so let's talk about the future. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the future of SUNY's online programs and and part of that, a subset of that conversation has been the role of online program management vendors or OPMs. Um, your chancellor has been quoted in the news, there's been a request for information. Um, I, I was sorry to have missed your provost speaking this morning about it, although I spoke with a number of you uh, to get your impressions about that talk. Uh, what I heard was very encouraging. Um, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, OPMs um, uh, and what and the larger perspective on, on change. Uh, but to do that, I, I want to provide some additional context. Um, like most developments in educational technology, we tend to talk about these online program management vendors ahistorically. Um, but they didn't spring out of Zeus's forehead fully formed. Um, they came somewhere. They have a history. And actually, you've heard some of their history already today on this stage. You just didn't know it. Um, and parts of their history will be familiar to you from a longer story arc. So arguably, the first known OPM uh, started well before online learning itself. Um, in 1970, uh, professor at San Jose State University wanted to start a bachelor's degree program um, for uh, working on police officers who had associate's degrees that wanted to get bachelor's degrees. And he wanted to start another program for working uh, teachers with bachelor's degrees who wanted to get master's degrees. This came out of earlier work he had done with both groups together, teaching a class to them about um, what well, the term, this was in 1968, 69, the term uh, at the time was juvenile delinquency. And both the teachers and the police officers found that continuing education to be really fulfilling and exciting. They wanted more. And so he went to San Jose State and said, There's, this is great. We could really help some people. Let's start a degree program. They said, yeah, no, that's not very interesting to us. So he went and started talking to other colleges in the area. And they weren't the same answer. Yeah, not very interesting to us. So he said, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll cover the upfront costs. Uh, I will develop the program. And, and in exchange, you can pay me a percentage of the tuition over a period of years. Um, he was able to get a few university customers to sign on to his new company. Uh, now, this again, the professor who, at, although he had a sort of, sort of a political conversion later, at the time he was, he was, this was a kind of a 1960s style liberal activism. Um, so he was able to get a, a few customers for his company, which he called the Institute for Professional Development. Now, now pay close attention here because this is the moment when the business model for online program management was formed in 1970. All of the ingredients are here except for the online part. Okay? The funding and program design are there. Right? You have uh, upfront costs paid by the company. Um, and a, a lot of the upfront work and design done by the company uh, uh, in exchange for an ongoing share of tuition long-term partnership. Notice also, from the very beginning, the focus is on non-traditional students, working adults. Right? Uh, this has also been part of the OPM model. You know, non-traditional students, right? Euphemism for underserved students, right? 
And a, a third piece of this, uh, which is a little bit, which is also interesting, is that this guy quickly discovered that the, the universities that were most willing to have a conversation with him about this arrangement were the ones that were in a little bit of financial trouble. So it turns out that, you know, getting institutions uh, to care about underserved students, necessity is the mother of compassion. Who knew? Um, so this professor eventually moved to Arizona and co-founded the University of Phoenix, which is the direct descendant of the Institute of Professional Development. He took all that he learned from that organization, that proto-online program management company, um, and uh, developed and rolled them into his own university. And as we heard from Tony, in those days, the University of Phoenix was doing very good work. It, it's not, it was not what we've come to associate with the uh, caricature of uh, for-profit university online education. Uh, it was pioneering stuff. Um, and then in 1989, the University of Phoenix offered its first online course on the Prodigy Network. For the youngins in the room, Prodigy Network, like, imagine Facebook, but without the rest of the internet. It was sort of like that. So, so the University of Phoenix grew like gangbusters uh, and was soon followed by other for-profit online universities, right? And this growth was, in fact, what fed the, deteri the eventual deterioration of quality in these online programs. It brought in different kind of investment money, different kinds of motives, and a, a corruption of the model. But it also brought a lot of attention, right? And I, you know, I interviewed, uh, I should say, during the, we should reflect for a moment on that period in the 1990s. So this year it's 2019, this is the 20th anniversary of Open SUNY, counting back 20 years, right? right? This is the same period when the Sloan Foundation was doing some of its pioneer work, pioneering work. It just, it was not as big yet. It wasn't as being noticed by entrepreneurs, but it was happening, right? Um, so, meanwhile, the, the, the for-profits, um, the question that they had was not yet about quality. It was a lower level challenge than that. It was, will anyone even recognize this degree as a degree? Is this, a, is this even going to be considered legitimate? Right? And I, um, uh, I interviewed a, a, an early for-profit university executive not too long ago. And he recalled being asked, what if the traditional universities figure out how to do online? And his immediate answer was, well, then we're dead. Uh, with their brands, um, they'll kill us. And not long afterward, he went on to found one of the early online program management companies. So there's this relationship from the very beginning between the story, that is the 20-year arc of, the, of Open SUNY and the SUNY Learning Network, and the history of online learning, and online program management. That it's the snake that swallows its own tail. Now, during the period, the next phase, you know, starting in, around the time that I arrived at, uh, um, at SUNY, the mid-2000s, and around the time that the world was beginning to notice not all of the successes of, of, the, of the Sloan Consortium fundees, but certainly UMUC, Penn State World Campus, right? A couple of, a couple of the, that, the early classes were getting disproportionate attentions. UMUC in particular because 
it's our University of Maryland, University College, because they had that connection to the military and so they had a, a particularly good enrollment funnel and their growth was, was really strong. Um, and they could roll it all up in a ball and they were one institution as opposed to 64. Um, so, um, so in the early, during the, the early 2000s, leading up to this period, the early, many of the early OPMs were one of two kinds of companies. Either they were enrollment management cooperatives like BISC, where schools would get together and facilitate it by a company that has some marketing expertise, and they would share knowledge about best practices. That might sound vaguely familiar to you as a kind of a model for schools working together, except for the commercial part. Um, or they were hosting companies like Embanet, which started off hosting Blackboard for schools, right? And, and what would happen is deans would come up to uh, these, the executives at these companies and say, I want to spin out an online program. Can you help me do that? And they'd say, uh, sure, even though they might not have never done that before. And then the dean would say, well, there's only one problem. My, my president thinks I'm crazy for this, and I have no money. Can, can you still help me? Uh, sure. And they would come to a revenue sharing agreement. And in those days, the way the revenue share agreement worked out was, was more like a franchise. It was the, the, the online program management company would do almost everything. The, the school would provide faculty, and that's about it. The, the company would provide the curriculum and the support and everything. And the revenue share percentage was about 80% to the company. The, uh, one of the OPM, uh, uh, early OPM executives that I interviewed called this the Dean's Gone Wild period. Right? Uh, so, so this is a period, right, when everybody's growing, the not-for-profits are growing, the, the for-profits are exploding right up to about 2010 when, when the Obama administration really dropped the hammer on them. Uh, and, uh, and the online program management companies are growing and they're popping up everywhere. There are new ones coming up all the time. And a couple of them start getting scooped up. And Bennett and Compass merge and then Pearson buys them both. Uh, there is a, a company, uh, uh, another one called uh, Deltac that gets bought by Wiley, right? So that was the first wave of consolidation. Just by the way, we're entering the second wave of consolidation right now. So let's pause for a moment and consider what these OPMs were in this period, what many of them still are, and let's compare that what they do to what the SUNY Learning Network was doing during that same period with help of money from the Sloan Consortium. We've already heard some foreshadowing of this. First, they were providing upfront cash to de-risk investment in new programs. Well, that's exactly what the Sloan Foundation did, right? It provided money to SUNY, some of which went to Central support for the learning management system and, and, you know, training and so on and so forth. And some of it went out to campuses and to faculty, right? Um, and they provided, they built up expertise and support services, right? Um, so both SLN slash Sloan and the OPMs also um, uh, developed course and program, provided course and program development, deployment, uh, marketing, and support methodologies, which scaled well based on the tools and methods that were available at the time, right? Um, it's here. You want to know how to do it? 
you, you don't have to start learning from scratch. We, we do this regularly. Um, in other words, using a combination of cash and operational expertise, they lowered the risk on and accelerated the development of sustainable online learning programs. Um, in return, they collected an on ongoing, uh, ongoing fees from the colleges. And that's true of Open SUNY as well as the online program management companies, right? Open SUNY gets fees through the university. It's, you know, academics feel dirty about it, so it's a little bit more hidden and you don't talk about it, and it's way lower than what the OPMs collect. Right. Today's contracts for full service revenue sharing OPMs is about 50 to 60 percent on average of, uh, of tuition. Right. So here's a question to ponder. And I'm not proposing this. I'm going to ask a few of these throughout the presentation. Take them as provocations, not as proposals. Okay. If Open SUNY connected, collected anywhere near the percentage that the, the OPMs do. And on, I honestly, I don't know what percentage Open SUNY collects. I suspect it's a lot lower. Um, would it have sufficient funding and capacity to replicate the kind of SUNY system-wide growth that SLN saw in its glory days on, with the Sloan Foundation funding? And if so, would that be a good deal for SUNY? Anyway, since 2012, in the last six years, the OPM market has really broadened out. Services have become unbundled, meaning you no longer have to go to a company and say, all right, we're going to sign a multi-year contract with you, and, and you're going to pay the upfront costs, and we're going to pay a percentage of our tuition for a number of years, right? And we're going to get, you know, everything. Um, you can, there's a much more of a fee-for-service model. We'll take that, that, and that from you, and we'll pay in cash, right? The, all kinds of models are proliferating with uh, different companies that have different strengths and focuses. Um, it's, it's really exploding. It, these, these companies, they don't necessarily replace OPM. These are really products rather than companies. They sometimes, the, the different bundles or offerings or arrangements exist within, are offered by the same company. Um, but the reason that we're seeing this proliferation is because we're no longer in the Dean's Gone Wild period. Right now, it, this is no longer about an entrepreneurial dean who wants to get extra growth. This is about schools or entire universities or entire systems trying to figure out ways to sustain themselves. And the ways in which they need to approach solving those problems are not all the same. You can't come in with a bundled, straightforward model. You have, there are going to be many, many different, I need a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I have this kind of funding, but not that kind of funding. So, um, so it, it's, it's chaos right now. It's a chaotic situation with people trying to, everyone calls themselves an OPM because nobody knows what else to call these other things that look a little bit like OPMs. We make a distinction between an uh, online program management, which is a full bundle, including revenue sharing, which, which we describe as a financial service, versus online program enablers, which are, they may have some of the same s services, but they're unbundled. You can pick and choose a la carte, um, or they may have different bundles, and you, they're typically fee-for-service. You can think about it a little bit as the difference between um, a long-term business partner with whom you have a tight relationship and uh, some interdependencies that you have to be think really carefully about, um, and a consultant that you pay upfront 
for as long as you need them. Um, so that's the picture of the market. Now let's take that context and come back to SUNY's situation. You know, um, I, I want to talk about a couple of the models that have been floating around um, that have been mentioned in articles uh, in magazine in outlets like Education Dive, and these are pieces that are coupled to get, cobbled together from a, you know a, an interview from your provost and a letter obtained by the publication to internal people written by the the chancellor and. You know, I actually thought that the Education Dive piece in particular was well written on the whole, but I haven't seen those sources. And I, 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 I don't assume that the way they characterize what your provost and dean say is what they actually meant to say. Um, everything that I've heard today um, encourages me. Um, nevertheless, without going into details, there are some little hints in that article that, you know, I, look, I've seen this, I've seen this, um, this let's make a big move movie many times before, and um, there is a, one really bad plot twist that you really want to avoid. I don't think that, that your, your leadership is writing this script, but I want to be really explicit about it so that we can make sure, right? So there, they, they mentioned a few examples, which I interpret them as saying, here are indicators that we see in the market that other schools are moving and we need to as well. That is a good, smart way to look at the market. Right. California is launching a 115th community college. That's new. That's different. It's, a, it's structured differently. It's, it's not associate's degree. It's actually pre-associate's degree um, uh, um, certificates. It's competency-based. That's all really interesting. California is a national and global leader. Often in the past when they've done things, the world has followed. We should pay attention to that. That's a smart way of looking at things. Um, you know, Southern New Hampshire is uh, a giant. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're really killing it out there. They're, they're, they're growing. They are, I, I, I use this word very sparingly, but I think it's fair in this case. They are innovating. Um, uh, I, I, you know, nobody's perfect, and y usually uh, nobody is as good as Southern New Hampshire is hyped to be, but they are good. Um, and they're right over your border, and they are taking students from New York, right? It is perfectly reasonable and smart for your leadership to be saying, we need to be paying attention to Southern New Hampshire as an indication of the threat to soon. Massachusetts, right? Just announced the other day. I, you know, when I saw this quote in Education Dive, I was a little confused because I, I hadn't seen anything. I hadn't, the news hadn't broken yet. I think your, your leadership knew something that I didn't know yet. Um, but they, Massachusetts has just announced that they're going to put out this new online uh, uh, campus for non-traditional students. You know, uh, for degree completion, um, that is another indication that our neighbors are doing something big, and we need to take that seriously. A smart, you know, read of the environment. Here's the bad way to read the, those pieces, pieces of news. California just launched their 115th community college, and we need to catch up. Let me tell you the one great virtue that Open SUNY has that the California 115th does not have. You exist today. The California 115th has no students, 
It has no courses. It has no curriculum. It just hired its president. Now, don't get me wrong. I am rooting hard for them. They are trying to tackle an important problem. We have done, my colleague Phil Hill has done a projection on illiterate, that even the best growth for a de novo program like this uh, is uh, the best you can hope for uh, is uh, tw 20,000 students in 10 years. Um, so, you know, Massachusetts is even less. You know, Massachusetts, nobody knows what it is. Sometimes you make an announcement not because you have a plan, but because you need a plan and you need to shake people up. Alex, how far behind in time am I? Okay. All right. Um, so, um, and Southern New Hampshire is a, they're, they're great, but they're nothing like SUNY and they'd be impossible to imitate. So again, I don't, I don't read your leadership as saying that they want to imitate these places, but that is just, you know, I guarantee you that there is somebody somewhere in the halls of power in Albany who thinks that way. Be prepared. Um, but let's step back from the shiny pa objects and look at the patterns, uh, which haven't really, uh, some of which haven't really changed since 1970. Um, colleges and universities need investment capital, operational support, and expertise from specialists to build out programs to reach underserved working adults. If you look across the giants today, like Southern New Hampshire, like Arizona State University, like University of Central Florida, our friends, like Western Governors University, like our uh, University of Maryland University College, or any of the successful for-profit universities, the pattern is the same. OPMs are simply companies that provide, not simply, but they are companies that provide external support for universities that do not have the internal resources to do this well or at all on their own. That is their raison d'etre. Okay. Um, what are now, you know, if you, it, whether you did this internally or externally, that's the, that, you know, that's the dynamic. So what are the pockets of need that drive enrollment? Some are similar and some are different. You know, you have the challenge of identifying the degree advancement paths that match your region. Uh, that, and that's been a, uh, you know, a pattern from the beginning. Where are the, where's the job growth, right? Honestly, higher ed has always had a spotty record at this. It's hard. Um, you need to get excellent at it. You need to get really, really good at it. Um, and, um, that, that, you know, that means, you know, starter jobs, it means middle skill jobs, jobs where there is degree inflation, you know, because you don't really need somebody with a bachelor's degree, but someone with an associate's degree, you know, it, they need a credential, a middle credential that doesn't exist, right? Um, high skills jobs, of course, right? Um, and more of those, de de those degrees are high skills jobs. There are more graduate degrees that are needed now. As I, as I said in my comment in the last panel, lifelong learning is not a feel good slogan anymore. It, it's a thing, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that undergraduate uh, uh, programs, uh, the need for them is gone. It doesn't mean that degree completion, that the, the mission that SUNY has, uh, that Open SUNY has served so well for so long is gone. It's a both and, right? You need to, in fact, get better at the thing you've done well and, and open up new avenues at the same time. And there's a whole world of certifications and skill badges, both pre and post degree, that blur the lines between college education, workforce development, and corporate training. There are, these are the opportunities. Just side note, by the way, to, to uh, reassure Tony, I am a, a philosophy undergraduate. Philosophy, uh, my philosophy degree prepared me uh, very well for a job of any, in anything except philosophy. Um, and ironically, I was recently at Carnegie Mellon University uh, talking about the advancements of uh, artificial intelligence to do philosophy work. So. 
no, you know, it's a kind of a good news, bad news story. Uh, I actually, I, I, I do believe um, that I, we need to be cautious about getting overly focused on job, you know, on, on skills. But if we're really talking about job readiness, honestly, thinking is a pretty good skill for people to have. Um, as is reading and writing and, you know, all that stuff. So, um, given the problem as I've described so far, there's no obvious reason to me why SUNY can't meet this challenge by increasing its investment in basic organizational structure it already has. All the, uh, any skills it doesn't already have can be acquired, strengths can be augmented, and weaknesses shored up. Doesn't mean you don't partner with external companies uh, or other organizations, um, but there's the structure that you built, uh, you know, over the last 20 years, uh, particularly in the early years, looks a lot like the structure that schools are turning to today. So it's really a question of modernizing, not creating from scratch. Um, now, so far the story has been straightforward and maybe it's even feel good. Maybe it's what you wanted to hear which I'm not really good at. That's not the kind of story I usually tell. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, SUNY did a lot of the right things. OPM's cribbed it out of the playbook for SUNY and other online pioneers, so on and so forth. Um, I, now I need to get to the uncomfortable part because I, you all know that, you know, as, as educators, the, in the Venn diagram where one circle represents the zone of proximal moral development, and the other circle represents the comfort zone, the, the intersection is pretty small, right? So if I'm going to do my job up here, I got to push a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Um, my Alex was very gracious. Her one direction to me was that I should tell you what I think you need to hear. So I'm going to try to do that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soften the blow first by saying mean thing is about other people. Um, I think we can all remember in 2012 when Stanford, Harvard, and MIT invented online learning. MOOCs changed everything, of course. Um, we had the prediction that there would only be 10 universities in the, in the world has come true. Um, bowling scores have gone way up. Miniature golf scores have gone way down. And a little later, these pioneers innovated again with something they called the small private online course the Spock. Um, and it's easy to laugh and, and fun. And I, I will say, you know, probably 10% of my blog writing and 80% of what people remember about my blog writing is snark. Um, and honestly, it's hard to feel too bad about mocking Harvard or Stanford about anything given the size of their endowments, right? They'll get over it. Um, but we shouldn't laugh too easily because this kind of ignorance is everywhere. It's, it is everywhere. Um, for example, if you ask me about two, year, two lead schools that are leaders in educational research and scholarship of teaching and learning and, and applied educational research, the two that would come to mind right on the tip of my tongue immediately would be University of, of Central Florida and Carnegie Mellon University. I could then follow with a list of others, but those two would be top of mind, right? And two people at, uh, you know, among, at those institutions would be Chuck Jubin and Marsha Lovett. And, you know, so, and Chuck knows everyone. I mean, Chuck knows everyone. But it turns out that Chuck doesn't know Marsha, and Marsha doesn't know Chuck. In fact, they had no idea about anything the other one was doing, personally or institutionally. People at University of Central Florida have heard of the Open Learning Initiative, but that's it. They knew nothing about each other. Because, you know, if you have a, you, you're in a slightly different university class, or you have a slightly different job title, or you go to slightly different conferences, you just don't meet each other. Right? And so you don't, you don't read the same journals. You, you, you don't know. Another example, James Madison University. 
as one of the largest psychometric programs, both academic and institutional, in the country. Twice a year, they take the entire university and have uh, uh, a, a day where they, they call assessment day, where they assess the entire university, n not the students, I mean the students take the test, but they're assessing the program effectiveness at a wide range of cognitive and non-cognitive factors. How many of you knew that? Yeah, spoil, spoil. I, I didn't. I, I learned it from you. Ah, uh, well, that, yeah, fair enough. Um, right, I mean, that's a big deal, and you guys know a lot of people too. We should know that. Coppin State University, historically black college uh, in inner city Baltimore, really a kind of a, a shining beacon in the middle of a neighborhood. It was the ground zero of the Freddie Gray uprising and not a single window was broken there because the people in that community know that that, that school stands for them. Um, how many, and, and I've been to that school, and I've been to that neighborhood, it's like a war zone. There are burnt out buildings on every block. How many of you know that uh, Coppin State has a major uh, learning analytics infrastructure and uh, a data democratization program designed to get every educator who has a, a stake uh, uh, in, uh, in a student's success, access to appropriate data about that student. I didn't know either. I wouldn't have known if the president of Coppin State hadn't been, you know, brave and, 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 uh, but, and also entrepreneurial enough to show up at BB World to give a presentation on it. Right? I mean, BB World is not where you see those kinds of presentations. So, I got lucky, right? We go to our conferences, we see our friends, we read our articles, we pick up a few tips, we try a few things. We think of our networks as innovation networks, our learning networks, but mostly they're our support networks, right? We go to complain about our colleagues at home, right? Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's so much going on in higher education and so little of it travels. You know, when Alex taught and I talked about me talking here, the first idea I pitched was about how, was this. It was about how, um, how we, need, we all need to be learning all the time. We need to be empirical educators. We need to constantly be testing our fundamental assumptions about what we think we know about teaching. And she said, Michael, you know, everyone in that room already knows that. And I know a lot of you, and I know you know that. But it's possible to know and not to know at the same time. When I heard y'all talking about your skepticism about teaching large classes online and, and can we achieve social presence, you sounded spookily similar to conversations I've heard from faculty who have never taught online about how, how can you possibly establish any kind of a social connection. There is a course at Arizona State University called Habitable Worlds. I don't know how many students they have now, but a few years back, the last time I checked, it was about 500. And um, they are, it's basically problem-based learning, right? They're, they're, their discussion design is not something you would recognize as such. And we, we have interviews of the students on, on our Illiterate TV YouTube channel. The students basically say, look, nobody tells us we have to go online and talk. There are no discussion prompts. But the problems are too hard to solve on our own. We have to go online and talk to each other. Right? How much more authentic can you get than that? That is a learning conversation. And guess what? The instructors, by design, their main job is to hang out on those discussion boards and participate in the dis discussions, which you would call coach. Now, maybe that feels pejorative to some, but Ariel Anbar, the co-designer of that course, 
sees that as a promotion. He says, I don't want to be a grader. I, 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 want to be a, I want to be a facilitator. I want to be focused on helping these students get unstuck. And, and, and it's what, the way I've designed this course, that's what I get to do. Habitable Worlds, by the way, is online. You can check it out for free, habworlds.org. So, look, you've all probably had that life-changing experience. This is what, one of the gifts that Sumi gave to me. When I came here and I heard faculty say, you know, I taught online, I learned to teach online from the Sumi Learning Network, and it was a, a, a it was a life-changing experience for me. It changed the way I teach in the classroom. How many of you have had that experience? Right? Okay. How many of you have had it twice? How many of you have had a, a life-changing teaching experience twice? Three times. How many of you go back to a campus where a majority of your colleagues have had that experience at least once? What's wrong with this picture? Isn't this the heart of what we're supposed to be doing? Like, if we were excellent at this, I don't think there would be a crisis. Right? This, you know, when people have life-changing experiences, you know who's excellent at this? You know whose core competence is this? Duke University. Duke University's core competence is making people feel like they have life-changing experiences so that they will give lots and lots of money back to the university for the rest of their lives. Seriously. And it's not a coincidence that Duke University, of all the universities in the country, and they're not the only one, but that Duke University has created a very significant size full-time professor of practice position that has all of the pr privileges of a tenure position, including uh, shared governance, except for tenure. They say, look, at a, at a research institution like Duke, you know, you go to a place like Princeton, you'll work your butt off for five years as a young faculty member. You work your fingers to the bone, and 99% chance will kick you out at the end. We're not going to do that to you here. Here, you come, we won't give you tenure, but we'll give you a real life. And your job is still to do research and teaching, but it's to do research on teaching. That's what happens when you decide that you're going to align your, uh, your mission with your sustainability. I want to very briefly revisit uh, my most painful experience here at SUNY. Um, and I don't want to go into, into a lot of detail, mostly because it's inside baseball. Um, uh, but those of you who were here remember that we went through a, a learning management system change effort. Um, this, this, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this gets to the heart of the challenge, the one thing that I think holds SUNY back, okay? Um, the SUNY had been a pioneer, had built a learning management system because there wasn't one when you started teaching online. And you faced a hard choice, right? You had the system that was built on Lotus Notes when IBM was saying, yeah, you shouldn't do that anymore. Um, it was loved by the people who used it. Um, the, the alternatives at, in 2006 to 2005 were bad. I mean, they were objectively bad. Um, and not only were they bad for an individual institution when you tried to scale them up to a diverse 64 campus system, they were not, they, they were exponentially bad, right? So I somehow ended up as part of a group that led a, uh, a, a research project on, you know, a search on, on this. And now, the, the irony is, I, I, in my current career, I, I, 
I do part of this partly for a living, and I, I do it study, having studied at the feet of the master of it, Phil Hill. Um, but I didn't know any of this at the time. So, you know, diligently we, you know, gathered our focus groups and, and stakeholder groups, and we talked to people, and, you know, we came up with the conclusion that all the alternatives were bad, right? And our solution that we proposed uh, was that, you know, we could build something better. We'd take an open source platform and um, we could extend it, you know, by uh, working with standards groups and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I could, I, I could get defensive and say, um, you know, directionally we were right. If you look at what happened with the standards bodies in the last 10 years and what uh, Educause is trying to do with what they call the next generation digital learning environment, it's all, you know, the same stuff. But it may surprise some of you to hear that I, I, I've come to the conclusion that we were wrong. Um, for two reasons. The lesser reason is that um, after I left SUNY, I, I worked at Oracle as a software developer. Uh, while I was there, I worked on a, on, at the IMS on the Standards Committee. I worked uh, with, directly with the Sakai Open Source Learning Management Group, and then I moved to Cengage, where I ran a fairly large uh, software development team. And during those experiences, I learned a healthy fear of software development and working with open source groups and standards development bodies. And, and looking back, I'm, I'm not convinced that with the, the standards and the software stack that was available at the time that we could have practically built something that would suck less. But the more important reason why I think that we were wrong is because we didn't convince SUNY that we were right. I mean, here's what happened. We got a committee together. The committee, you know, was reasonably diverse. We convinced the committee. We took our, our answer uh, to the powers of the B. The powers of the B hastily assembled another committee. And that committee decided to tell us that we needed to assemble a new committee. And they would tell us who would be on this new committee. And those people would keep us in check. So we got together the new committee. And we ran through the decision making process of the, with the new committee. And, um, and that new committee came to the same conclusion as the old committee. And that decision was unanimous. And we took it to the powers that be. And the powers that be in came, uh, assembled in the star chamber and came back with an answer, angel. And we said, but only three or four schools in SUNY use angel. And they said, Angel. And we said, but Angel won't scale to a single instance for 64 campuses. And they said, Angel. And I, to this day, I don't know how Angel got picked. And I just spoke today with someone who had gotten drafted onto that higher committee. And what's disturbing is that person also doesn't remember how that decision was made, right? There's no, there was no memory of any process, right? No memory of any selection process. Now, what's, here's the problem. The problem is it wasn't whether Angel was a better choice than something else, right? What I have learned, there are, you know, there are, sometimes there are objectively better and worse choices. But looking back, you know, what I didn't see in, in the process, certainly in time, was that we convinced nobody outside of the committee and a handful of other people. The people who used the SLN platform wanted to keep the SLN platform and lobbied anyone in power to keep the SLN platform. The people who used Blackboard wanted to keep using Blackboard and lobbied anyone in power to pick Blackboard. The people, the one campus, I believe, that used WebCT Vista wanted WebCT Vista and lobbied the people in power. The people who used Angel wanted to keep using Angel, right? So that, first of all, it took me a long time to recognize. 
I absolutely, unequivocally, personally failed. I failed to see that coming, and I failed to do anything about it. The open question is whether I could have done anything about it. And this brings me to the point that really matters. Because who the hell cares? You know, honestly, it was a long time ago. And I'm not bitter, really. <laughs> the real question is whether things are any different now, right? You, you guys are, you've got these big plans, right? You, 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 you know, you're going to roll up all of these courses. Well, you're going to run into the problems you've run into before. I was talking uh, with Rob about this earlier, right? You've got, you've got to work out cross-registration agreements, which, you know, you've worked out and you haven't, right? Um, and then, then you've got to work out your, you, you know, there's the actual student experience of, uh, well, I, I don't want to go through a portal and then go to this SIS and that SIS and so on. Well, you know, that's a really hard technical problem, right? And then you've got marketing, which is this whole new world, right? I mean, you guys do marketing, but this is honestly the areas where the, the OPMs have made the biggest stride is in uh, marketing and student, you know, uh, uh, demand prediction. Right? This, this is, um, the expertise is acquirable one way or another, but this is, this is like serious stuff, right? Um, but a lot of this ha comes down to the hard choices of working together, right? You know, let's take an easier decision, right? You're on Blackboard locally hosted. That, and, you know, I'm not gonna be indelicate here, but locally hosted at a brand new, data center at iTech, right? So you've made some LMS moves since I've been here, but what would be the political challenges in moving from locally hosted to cloud hosted? Or from Blackboard to another LMS? And how many of those political challenges are necessary? And how many of them are part of the fact that SUNY isn't really a system? I used to say when I was here that SUNY doesn't exist. That it is a, uh, a, a story that we tell and a light level of bureaucracy with a logo that is laid precariously on top of 64 separate colleges and universities. That, I was, that was in my most bitter days. But, but the, the point is, um, you, you, if you're going to solve this problem, you've got to come together in a different way. Um, you, you've, and and I, this is the tar pit that I got stuck in. And this is the tar pit that you can't get stuck in if you're going to survive. I, I was warned by this by one of you when I was here, actually. Pam, who I, I think sensed in a moment that I was in pain. Um, came to me and said, I want to tell you a joke. I was not in the mood to hear a joke. And, but she was so kind, I couldn't be rude. So she said, how many faculty does it take to change a light bulb? And I just sullenly waited in silence for the punchline. And she said, change? Right? So, so this is, that's the problem, right? That's the tar pit, right? You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to change together. This is on an individual pedagogical level, and it's on an institutional and system level. If you want a nuanced and sympathetic read of how all this plays out, into what, and why curious faculty who care deeply about pedagogy, nevertheless finding themselves resisting evidence-based pedagogical processes, Read the work of anthropologist Lauren Herkis, H-E-R-C-K-I-S. A lot of it is still in publication, but it's beginning to trickle out. Uh, there are lots of good reasons, and you know this, why people learn to keep, good people learn to keep their heads down and stick to their needing. The, the saddest part of her work uh, is the, the denial that she finds, although she doesn't call it this. Um, justifiable caution out of a sense of duty to your students 
and fear of personal failure can be hard to separate. Sometimes we hide from ourselves. I'm, I'm getting close to a wrap up. Am I way over? Uh, wrap up. Okay. So my friend at Randy Bass at Georgetown recently told me a great quote from Charles Eames. This is what pulls it all together. Design is the sum of all constraints. When we look for silver bullets or a magic company or a magic school we can emulate, we are dodging the fundamental problem that we have constrained ourselves in the wrong ways to come up with the solution that we need. To get to the right design challenge, SUNY needs to look at a few different kinds of constraints. The first I already described, which is a set of constraints you developed for yourself when you originally designed the SUNY Learning Network with the funding critical of the Sloan Foundation. The second kind has to do with aligning incentives to create, uh, to work together in a decentralized system. If you want a good model to this, look to California, but not to the 115th. Look to the California Community College's online education initiative and the work that they've done uh, to get all 114 community colleges to pull together. It's still early days and there's a lot to be proven, but they are dealing with some of these hard challenges that we've talked about. The third kind of constraints is building for what students need today. I'm not going to beat this to death. We've already talked about it, but you need to, you need to be laser focused on this. Student-centric means something. It means thinking like a student and, and never stop looking at you know, what, what their daily experience is and where, they, where you lose them. The fourth set of constraints relates, relates to the third. You have to keep challenging yourselves. You have to be prepared to be wildly, deeply wrong all of the time. That's what it means to learn. That's what it means to have a life-changing experience. That's why I'm excited to hear Yakut Ghazi uh, speak tomorrow. I, I understand she's sick and will be hearing her remotely. But nevertheless, I, don't, I, I want to be challenged by Georgia Tech's model. I'm, I, am, I am skeptical and I am hopeful. Um, and the final set of constraints is the inherent character of SUNY that you do not want to lose. Figure out what that is, right? Properly understood, these are advantages. Don't fight them. Don't try to be someone else. Leverage them. By all means, learn from California and Massachusetts, but be SUNY. You know, learn from the others to be the, to, to be the SUNY that you can become. So to sum up, just a few things. First of all, and most importantly, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been on an amazing journey and it started here and I wouldn't have made it if I hadn't had you all here. And I, it's taken me 14 years to realize and appreciate how much you've done for me. Um, second, focus on the constraints, don't obsess on the shiny thing. Third, remember that whether those constraints are productive or counterproductive comes down to whether they help or hinder your efforts to change people's lives through education. If you change more lives more quickly and reliably, the system will survive and thrive. Your enrollments will grow, as will your revenue. Fourth, remember that too many people, uh, remember, remember that the people whose lives you want to change through education include you. Uh, you are probably here because you've had at least one life-changing uh, educational experience. Honestly, there's really no other rational reason for you, the career path you've chosen. Create a life-changing experience for yourself, again. Fifth, if your colleagues are your rivals, then you're doing something wrong. Stop, figure it out, and fix it. The system won't work unless you do. Sixth, if you get long-term investment and act in unity, then you can achieve every, anything. And I don't mean that in a generic you. I mean SUNY, I mean the people here in this room. If you, and I don't say these things. I don't. Uh, if you don't do these things, then you can achieve nothing. Uh, no matter who you hire or what university you imitate. And finally, don't forget that Kierkegaard's full expression was to take a leap of faith in fear and trembling. And the title of his book was not a leap of faith. It was fear and trembling. Embrace your fear. Change that light bulb. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you.
out and what you have shared. And uh, so I have this question because you have long journey and you have experienced all these things in the process. Um, and then you hit upon some important points. Yeah. So I was about to ask you, what is the secret of success of uh, New Amsterdam that you have carried? You know, Southern New Amsterdam. Um, so uh, there, you know, they they do a lot of things right, but um, I, if I had to boil it down, it's that they are, have good leadership that gets everyone aligned. Um, uh, just like I was saying before, they're all on the same page, um, and they know who they are. As because I had that question on my mind, and as you were wrapping up, I also googled their website. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it, it, that, that actually then goes to brand and marketing, right? You can't market yourself if you don't have any idea of, of who you are, right? Your brand is your identity. It's, it, it's your reputation. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing to see that they have grown from 2,500 to 80,000. So I did the math. It's a 3,100 person growth. Yeah, they're pretty impressive. Yeah. The sun now? Oh, yes, it is. Michael, thank you for <coughs> your insightful and inspiring remarks. Um, I want to go back to the OPM part of your discussion. And yeah. we went back and forth a little bit on OPMs as investors. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I sort of bemoan the fact that there's a dearth. I mean, if we stop and think, how many banks are there in the United States? If I wanted to start a new business, how many banking options would I have? Yeah. How many OPMs are there? Yeah. It's a very, very fraction of the number of other kinds of invest investors. And I don't think higher education has the kind of experience to know whether they're getting a good deal or not when they agree to sign off on 50% of the revenue of the startup that they're trying to make over a course of seven years based on the investment the OPM is making. Is there a way for us to benchmark that as a good deal or a totally a total ripoff? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's hard to make the comparison because they're closer to venture capitalists than banks, and there there are a lot more venture capitalists than there are OPMs, but there are a lot fewer that, than there are banks, um, and and even that's not a great comparison. Um, I think you know transparency is a good place to start. And even before that, um, clear product uh, category definition. Like, let's just stop calling um, um, offerings that don't include revenue sharing OPM. Let's call them something else so that we know that, OK, how many of these things are there? Because we can't even count them now. Um, I think of a voluntary effort on the part of colleges and universities, this is scary and, and probably unrealistic, but I'm going to say it because we should do it. Uh, you know, a voluntary effort on colleges and universities to, to share their contracts. Obviously, the public ones have to do this, but a lot of these colleges and universities that are signing these agreements are non-public. Um, you know, somebody could get aggressive and do a lot of FOIA requests, uh, but uh, it would be much better to have a voluntary alliance um, or, um, and to have the, the providers themselves uh, try to provide a little clarity. You know, there's, a, there's always a tipping point in any industry um, for a long period of time. O lack of, of transparency is to everyone's benefit or at least to the market leader's benefit until there, there's a dynamic where competition reach, reaches a level where transparency suddenly becomes a, com a competitive um, lever to pull. So we, that I don't have a good answer to you, but, but for you, but it's for sure a problem worth tackling. So Michael, I just have, you know, all of these thoughts are going through my head and I so appreciate your perspective and your, your, your insight is, is just 
amazing to, to listen to. And I know you said that you were talking about the Sloan Foundation and the investment that it made in SUNY, and we're kind of ha seeing the parallel with the OPMs as investors, yeah. uh, right? And, you know, I had the opportunity to sit next to Ralph Gomery and have dinner with him mm. uh, a couple of um, a, a couple of months ago. And um, for those of you who don't know him, he's an incredible um, person um, who started the Anywhere Anytime um, uh, initiative in the early 90s, and maybe it was even a little before then, um, uh, that resulted in the Sloan Foundation's grants to fund yeah. and seed um, asynchronous learning networks around the country. And he, he told me that the reason that he came up with that idea was because when he was a teenager, he used to work alongside itinerant farmers um, in fields picking, and I can't remember exactly what they were picking, mm -hmm. and um, that he saw their lives greatly impacted by the lack of access to education. And uh, so when you were talking, as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about the difference in motivation Mm -hmm. <laughs> between the OPMs and between the spirit behind which the funding was made to all of us who were uh, beneficiaries of those early grants to, to design mm -hmm. asynchronous learning networks. And I, I think we can't lose it. Like somebody, I think it was Greg, put a, a meme out there about using our power for good. This was one of our mantras when in the SLN early days, right? <laughs> we only use our power for good. and and. And this, you know, uh, you can't help but say, you know, what is the the spirit behind the OPMs is to invest, but what they're looking for is profit, right? Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I want to be. I think higher ed has a tendency to externalize responsibility for decisions for which they are complicit, right? I mean. Uh, David made a point earlier about the, the devil's bargain that math professors made a long, long time ago, right? About, hey, I don't have to grade math problems anymore, right? And, well, you can follow that chain back a long, long way. I, I, how many of you know any, uh, have read about uh, the, the, um, the California plan and Clark? Kerr's idea of the multiversity. I, I know this sounds obscure. I, I highly recommend you read not a Wikipedia article, but a book or three about it. I have been going to school on this, and it has explained so much to me of, the, of what we're seeing now. Because higher ed, by design, you know, California is really laid the plan for the country and now much of the world in terms of how a university was designed or congealed. And it was designed to be in tension with itself, right? And so some of the ways that the university dealt with those, you know, the research and the teaching and all that, right? Because it needed multiple funding sources and buy-in from multiple political groups. So the way that it dealt with those tensions was to hide them with deals under the table. And this is just, and meanwhile, we've been, you know, as a society too, we've been defunding. And so the way we deal with this is we bring in alternative funding, private funding, right? So don't hate the player, hate the game, is what I would say. I, I, I don't, I am sort of utilitarian about um, all of these companies. I think some of them, uh, have been net good and some of them have been net bad for the institutions. I think all of them come with trade-offs and I think it is undeniable what you just said that um, they, there is an entirely different spirit that has deeply different implications for the path that we head down, right? So having New York, the state of New York, step up and say we're going to fund this internally rather than going to a revenue share would be a good model. And you know, if they, they, need, if they need to experiment with revenue shares here and there because there's a rationale for it, okay. But, uh, but as, a, 
as a as the model for the for for higher ed, it's uh, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with it too. Okay, well, um, I I want to wrap us up and thank okay. you very much for the provocative and thoughtful um, commentaries. Very very thank you very much, thank you. and thank you all for hanging in there with us uh, today. We are having dinner at six o'clock right next door. We have some um, uh, slideshow that we're going to show and some comments from our uh, community folks, um, and so I'm hoping you will join us at six. I think we have a little bit of a break, not too much, but before before dinner begins. How many? Six minutes. Six minutes. Yay! <laughs> We're not over time. <laughs> so run up to your room, dump your stuff, and come back down. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone who hung in online. Um, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow um, uh, for our workshop with Georgia Tech. This has been an awesome uh, conference so far. I hope you can join us tomorrow, too. Thank you so much. <laughs>